So I've been collecting since 1975, and over the years developed a real passion for these. Uh, my, maybe after this, somebody in here will have a passion. But here we go. This, in 1848, um, daguerreotype is Fontaine and Porter had a gallery in Cincinnati, and they decided to make a panorama photo using eight full plate daguerreotypes of Cincinnati, a two mile stretch along the Ohio River. Uh, it looks like when it was done, it looked like that, and it hung in the Cincinnati Library. That's that's a whole two miles of Cincinnati there. Then. About 10 years ago, they sent the uh, photograph to Eastman House to have it restored, to take the dust and uh, rid of some of the tarnish and just get it back up to the way it was when, when the picture was originally taken. And the way that they did it, they had just gotten a new microscope uh, to look for dust and spots and specks and things like that, and they used that to get rid of those, and as they were doing it, they realized we can blow this up and it's not getting any fuzzier or anything. The, the uh, resolution is pretty much the same. So they started experimenting with it. They found that they could blow it up to 30 times what it is and not lose any of the clarity. That's because there's no pixels or dots per inch or anything like that in the daguerreotype. It's, it goes right down to the molecule. And you can actually see things with the microscope that you can't see with the naked eyes. So this is some examples. So that's out of that first daguerreotype we saw. You can't read those. See it over on the right? You can just barely read them. And then when you blow it up, it doesn't. Get, the, the printing isn't fuzzy or anything. They said they could actually blow up, take a print of this, and blow it up to 20 feet by 100, 170 feet. And, it, and you can actually feel like you're walking down the street in Cincinnati. They found all kinds of information. Um, Found out why there was a cholera epidemic. You can see the sewage come running down one of the streets and little kids with buckets picking water out of the river. They said that was evidence of where the uh, cholera epidemic came. That, that's even closer. And with the projector, you can't go as close as you can with the uh, microscope, so I just did a couple. This is at the uh, Cincinnati Public Library now, and if, if you're interested, online, if you look up 1848 Panorama, Cincinnati, they actually have this printed there, and you can blow it up yourself. You can ha have it on your screen, uh, computer screen, and it make blow-ups, and you feel just like you're walking down the street. Cincinnati, there's another blow-up. So there's no pixels because no it's pixels. actually an image in, in silver dust. Right down to the... the so it's right down up. to the particle of silver. Right. If it's blurry here, like this is a group of men, this is a group of African American men right here. And if, if all kinds of men, they can see faces in windows, uh, laundry on some of them. There's eight of them, and the whole place are seven inch by nine inch, so that's about a five foot long panorama. There's another. These are blow ups, these are just details of the original. So the eight of them, eight full plate, which is pretty unusual full plate. They were very expensive. It went to the Crystal Palace in 1851, and they won all kinds of awards. That's what I was talking about, where the sewage is going down. And then yeah, as the daguerreotype goes down further, we can see little kids getting buckets of water for two loaves of blood. <laughs> what town was that again? What city? Cincinnati, Cincinnati. 1848. And then I'm just going to do a brief thing. Around 1800, people were trying to figure out a way to take the image that you got off a camera obscura. The camera obscura goes all the way back to 400 BC. The Leonardo da Vinci had one, Vermeer used them. Around 1800, they started thinking they had the proper chemistry and optics and everything to make a, um, an image that is permanent by putting some kind of treated paper or material on it. And um, there's probably 20, 20 scientists that were trying 1800. I've got some pictures of a couple of them. This, this is a camera obscura. Underneath that lid is where the ground glass was that they would put a piece of paper and trace it on it. This is also camera obscura. This is Daguerre's 
first camera. One of his first cameras. It's one that he started making doubles of and selling. But you can see it's just like a camera obscura. Some of them had just um, pinholes in them, but the, the lenses scattered more light so they could get stronger images. But this is a American daguerreotype cameras made out of rosewood, ivory, and brass. They look like sculptures. They're pretty rare. There's probably only 20 in existence now. That's uh, Thomas Wedgwood. He actually made a photograph in about 1790. Uh, he, he made them off of the camera obscura. He called them sun prints. The problem was he couldn't find a proper fixer, and you could only view it three or four times, and then it was black because there was no way to stop the sensitive, light sensitivity of the paper that was on. Th this is just a picture of him, that's not one of his. This is Neefs. Neefs is a guy that actually was the first successful photograph, technically. His was on pewter, and he used asphalt as the light sensitive material. Uh, he washed the asphalt away after the image was planted on. Here, this is that's his camera, and this is the first photograph, still in existence at the University of Texas, but it's pewter with asphalt, an asphalt coating. And that's about as good as, and it wasn't practical, that carrying that around. Daguerre's was the first practical kind of photography. There's Daguerre. Now, this is some of his earlier, some of his earlier work, like 1835, that's just sticking out on a windowsill out his window. This is a still life he took. This is mid 30s. Now this is a boulevard in Paris that he took from a rooftop. And the thing that distinguishes this is the first human being ever photographed is in this picture. The, the, uh, it was probably about a minute exposure time. So anything that moved would just be invisible. But this guy down in the corner there was getting his shoe shine and stayed still long enough to Get recorded on that plate, and later on they decided that was the first photo. This is Samuel Morris. He was in Paris in, the, in 1839 trying to sell his telegraph idea to scientists and things, and he just <coughs> coincidentally met uh, Daguerre, learned the process, and brought it back to the States, taught classes at NYU. Uh, a lot of the Brady, Plum, Southworth and Hawes, all of the early daguerreotypists learned from him. He charged $25 to $50 to learn, to learn the process. Now that's uh, Washington Square in New York City. That's out a window at NYU where he taught. He uh, did this in conjunction with another professor named John Draper. There's a first picture of the first daguerreotype of the moon, first photograph of the moon. That was done by Draper, Morse's partner. This is a later daguerreotype of the moon. This is later on in astronomy, that could be a, a field of uh, astronomers used daguerreotypes for photography. That is the only existing picture that Morse took, or portrait that Morse took. He took many more, I'm sure, but that's the only one that's left. And it's owned by the Met, Metropolitan Museum of Art. That's the first selfie, Robert Cornelius. <laughs> he had the first gallery in Philadelphia. And, uh, what, do that's mean by, what do you mean by gallery? Like studio? Where you sold, where you, you pay and pay, and he take your picture. Okay. And 39, the, the very first one was, um, not Claude. I think it was Morris. Morris, Morris and Draper did that, but they didn't <clears> say in the 39. That's Fitz, that's supposedly the first uh, profile, 1839. That's Fox Talbot, who at the same time that Daguerre was working out his daguerreotype process, he worked out something called a calotype or a talbot type, where he soaked paper in a silver nitrate, which made it light sensitive. Um, his, though, was a negative process. His things came out negative, and then he had to, that's his cameras, then he had to put the negative onto a, onto a piece of paper that was also treated with silver nitrate, and he got a positive. These are some Talbot types where he laid. What, are they, what do you call that print? Uh, it's either a Talbot type or a Talbot type, whichever. Whatever you prefer. How did they fix it? Uh, salt, salt water. He found out that sodium washed away the uh, chemical that made it light sensitive. These are some of the 
calotypes that he took. But they're interesting, but the thing is that the paper absorbs some of the chemical and makes it a little bit fuzzy around the edges, whereas the Gares is on metal and it's just crystal clear at the edges. But these sell at auction pretty well. They look like art prints. This is uh, one yeah, of the. You get photography as you know today. Daguerreotype. Right. It was the first practice. Well, daguerreotypes came out for about 20 years, and the talotypes were kind of simultaneous at the same time. But they didn't sell those in galleries until I was there. It was the first negative that had negative. This is uh, New York City Broadway in the 1840s. These are really outdoor daguerreotypes are very rare. That's Greenwich Village. There's San Francisco Bay in the 1850s, like 1851, right around the uh, gold rush time. That is a store that went up in a boom town in California. Those are probably miners there. They could get their provisions and groceries and things like that. That's another Cincinnati. That's by Ezekiel Hawkins, probably 1850 on the waterfront. Contemporary supporter and Beltane. That is the oldest existing photograph of the Alamo, 1846. So that when that was taken, the battle was only 10 years old. It, was, was, it wasn't restored either. No, that's exactly what it looked like after the yeah. battle. And then this is what it looks like today. You have an idea how, how much restoration was done. This is a Western family. There are a lot of pe people had their pictures taken. They move out west. They have the daguerreotype taken and send this daguerreotype back to the east to their families. So that was kind of a popular thing. That's everything they owned there, and supposedly showing them cross grain. What year was that? That's about 1845, 1850 in that era. This I owned this once in the 80s. I, I got it in. Uh, Ohio, and it's a supposedly a politician. This is Hallmark uh, Museum determined this. They now own it. Um, that that's a politician doing a soapbox speech in downtown Lebanon, Ohio. And How come the people there are not looking at the politician? They're looking at the other way. Hey, they probably said, "Hey, go out and take the picture. Look up here." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's out of a window. How long is the exposure? Not very long, less than a minute, maybe 30 seconds at the most. It, it, that long exposures didn't last very long. That was the first couple of years. Then they got it down to 15 seconds. And eventually, with changes in the chemistry and the optics and everything, it, it got down to five seconds. And then, you know, then you had to use a shutter. That would have been in the 1860s, probably Civil War time. But the, the, the myth that they used took three minutes to take and all that, it, it, the only time that was was in the first couple of years. Anyway, I paid $700 for that in 1980, sold it for about $3,000, and when it sold to Hallmark, it went for $60,000. So I got rid of it a little bit too early. That's about the nicest one ever. Oh, this is, uh, these are Revolutionary War uh, veterans. And let me just give you an idea. The, this guy's name was Levi Hayes, and he was a fifer in the Continental Regiment uh, of Connecticut. He settled Granville, Ohio. So that guy was actually in the Revolutionary War. There's probably about 200 people during the Daguerrean age that have their photographs taken. It's a category of collecting. That's Simon Hicks. He was a Minuteman um, and was at the Battle of Lexington and Concord. I won't go through all the biographies. This is Jonathan, Jonathan Smith. He fought at the Battle of Long Island. Some of them, they do have their age on there. The one I'm going to show you is 100 years old. These guys are all in their 80s and 90s, mostly 90s. Wow. This guy, let's see, is he? This is Peter McIntosh. <laughs> yes, that's Peter McIntosh. And he was a blacksmith, and he said he wasn't in the Boston Tea Party. He was a blacksmith in Boston, but some of his friends came running into his shop and got cinders from his fire and blackened their face before they ran on to, to 
join in the Tea Party. And then he later uh, enlisted as a surgeon to make, became a doctor later. He's another veteran of the California. This guy is Caleb Atkinson. He was a Quaker and was alive during the Revolution. He lived in Springfield, New Jersey. Um, he didn't fight in the Revolution, but he was alive during it. And the Spring Springfield, New Jersey had a battle there, and he lived there during that battle. So he may have seen George Washington, or who, who knows what. Not, not all of this is reported. It, I get the information from obituaries and stuff like that. This is some, these are just some elderly people that were born in the, I own that one, in the 18th century, which is unusual to get these. That's, I own that one, so it's in a book now. This guy was just bought on eBay just recently. They're not very, that's not very expensive. They're not identified. That was a birthday present to me, my sister. He was born in the 18th century too. Okay, now then the presidents, the presidents that were um, daguerreotyped are probably about 10 of them. That's John Quincy Adams. He was the sixth president. This is long after he retired. He was president in the 1820s, I believe. Oh, excuse me, when was that one? Um, yeah. It'd be in the 40s, because I think he died 1849. So it's probably 47, 48. This one's Andrew Jackson. He also died in the 40s, so this one's in the 40s. He was, he, during the Revolution, he was a teenager, got caught, and spent most of his time in a prison ship in New York Harbor. And he hated the British. That's Martin Van Buren. James K. Polk, under his presidency, the United States doubled in size. This is a boom town in California that was set up during the gold rush. Uh, this is more mining. That is a daguerreotypist uh, wagon in California that he went out and would go from boom town to boom town and take, take portraits of people, and then they would mail them back to their homes. But you can see the daguerreotypes on the wall that he's got there, examples of his work. That looks like a mobile home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's been on a track, too. They could, he could put it on a train and have it taken out. So he took the photos in that little uh, room and then developed them and made them. Right, everything was done in there, and that was the light source for the portraits. I see. It's on wagon wheels. <laughs> okay, these are the, some 19th century celebrities. Anybody know who that is? John Brown. Frederick Douglass. How about this guy? P.T. Barnum and Tom Thumb. Wow. This guy everybody knows. Anybody guess it? Who? Elvis Presley? No. It's about 1850 or whatever. That's Mark Twain. Oh, wow. That's a young man. This one you should all know too. The name, I mean. I don't, not many people know this. It, it may have been hand colored. Yes, it was colored. You could see yeah. the skin yeah, tones. Yeah. What's that? Can you go back to PT Barnum? Right there. Thank you. That's all I needed. I like that. Okay. That's, does anyone recognize him? That's Thoreau. William Henry. Wow. Thank you. That's around the time. He was well known. How about this guy? Matthew Brady. Civil War photographer. Yeah. Very young. He took classes from uh, Morris. He's one of Morris's students. And he also is famous for taking pictures of Civil War. This guy, everybody knows the name too. Kit Carson. Thomas Cole, one of my favorite painters. This guy, I don't know, but maybe somebody here would know. That he's got a hat in his belt or he's holding a, knife, a bowie knife, but I don't know who it is. It may be anonymous. Jacobson. Yeah, you could say that. And this, oh. Oh. yes, and this, there's, I think there's eight daguerreotypes in it, all taken in the 40s because he died in 49. This daguerreotype in 1980, 7980, was sold for $9,000 through Sotheby's, and at that time, that was the most anyone ever spent for a daguerreotype. Wow. When was that? 1979, 80. It's a Sotheby's auction. Mm -hmm. It was bought by Cliff Cranick. He's a Washington, D.C. Uh, collector. He paid nine grand for it. That, it would be priceless today, 30 years later. I don't, I, I don't think they... Who is in the closet? Huh? 
Excuse me? Who is it and why is it Christ? That's Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, okay. And it was, I think it was taken by South or the Mall. No, no, it was, it was an, an anonymous figure. What, what is going on at the bottom? I don't know. It, I, that, like, it looks like his hand is coming out of his jacket or something. It looks like he's holding something. Yeah. It's a color. It's a banana. It's a Napoleonic. It's a Napoleonic color. Napoleonic now, I'm going into occupational. So that was another big thing with daguerreotypes. People would go and bring tools and things that indicated what occupation they were in. And this is a real heavy field of collecting. This guy was a case salesman. A what? The case, the daguerreotype cases. There was a big market oh, in that. Oh, he would go around to the studios and sell cases. Or people that had the guarantees that wanted to change the case. Yeah. That's another big field of collection. Guess what this guy? Pharmacist. Chemist. <laughs> pharmacist. He's a pharmacist. pharmacist. Yes. Yeah. He's a pharmacist Walgreens. or a chemist. <laughs> These guys. Bakers. Yeah. Bakers. They sold bulbs and clothes. These are actors. Oh, I love it. In a pose, probably from whatever play they're in. I think that's. that's uh, this guy's either a student or a scientist. That's a microscope. They're hand tinted. That's quite a common uh, clothing. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm pretty cool. Yeah. This is a daguerreotypist. So those are the most expensive occupationals you get. You can get a picture of a photographer that's identified. Museums would go nuts over that. And the, these are the only two. That This guy's a reverse glance painting, painter, painting, painter. Yes. Blacksmith. Yeah, the, the fire iron. And this is a tin smith. A what? Tin smith, yeah. There's a painter. This is a gallery owner here that sells lithographs and before yes. photography yeah. was considered an art, so there weren't any. So in galleries, you got your picture taken, you didn't sell it. Yes, that's it. He's a hypnotist or a mesmer. 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 That's a telegrapher. There are a lot of women telegraphers. 40s and 50s. That is a city editor. Anything in his paper. That is a chance. That's a music teacher. I own that one once. A musician. There are all kinds of gear types of different types of musicians. Well, that's rare because he's black. Isn't yeah, it? I've got a section of ethnic uh, photos too. There, there was a man, Thomas Easterly, that went around and took pictures of Native Americans, and those are all museum owned. But th this is, yeah, that's a really strange trumpet too. I'd love to hear what that sounds like. Now, here's to dispel the myth that nobody smiled in those days and just put a view in here. Oh, it was only, it wasn't a tradition to smile, and that's why every single one isn't a, a smiling person, but they did smile. Wasn't it also because the evening was so stern was because of dur the duration? No, in the beginning that would have been, in the first years, but the, it, you, know, you can hold a smile for 10 seconds or 5 seconds. And that's all. It wasn't yeah. part of the culture. Right, in other words. right. It was a learned thing. And eventually, yeah. look pleasant was the first thing, and then it was smile. And that's 20th century. That's oh. really oh. smart, deliberately. <laughs> and that it's a giver type. There's a young girl. So that's just, a, and there's somebody not really smiling. And I did own that one too. I bought it in Washington State, and immediately sold it. And now it's owned by Hallmark, the, the museum. Hallmark has a great photo collection. Now, this is a Mexican War. This is uh, General Wool marching through Mexico City during the Mexican-American War. That is either a soldier or a, a militia man. I'm not sure. Those are soldiers. That's a half plate. That just sold recently, too, for a huge amount. That's a, that's a photograph like that. Hand-tinted. It was useful. They probably turned it into a lithograph. And, Used it for propaganda. Those are young soldiers, also, definitely. That's the Mexican War. Well, explain the plates sizes. 
Um, the, the most common was six plate, and I think everything in here is a six plate. There may be one ninth plate. Um, I've got them written down somewhere, but the, the uh, whole place was just a standard large one, which was very expensive. Was uh, I can give you? It was seven by nine, and a half plate would probably be five by six. What would be half a seven by nine? That was a half plate, which yeah. was a larger. Yeah, all all along, they had standard sizes. So yeah. The higher the number, the smaller the plate. I've got it written down. Okay. I mean. No, that's not. Yeah. yeah. I can give you. Uh, so how how was the plate? Term, I mean, how how was it done? Like the size of the plate was done in the camera? Uh, no, if you were a daguerreotypist and you, you would charge by the size. And somebody said, I want a picture of my family in a large daguerreotype. You said, well, this one is $15, this one is seven, and you would pick what you wanted. And the larger they were, the more expensive they were. And a daguerreotypist used standard sizes all over the United States after about 1843. And everybody used six plate, quarter plate, half plate, and whole plate. Just have to look at the whole. Thing. These, these are solid plates, right? You, they're not. Here you go. Transparent. That is a daguerreotype with the without an image on it. For anybody else wants. So, to. so when you had the plate, this was the picture, then, right? Yes. When you were done, that's what it looked like. On the other, this is copper, and then they put a, a electro plate silver on it, mm -hmm. and then they bump it to a mirror. I'm assuming when they after they had it. Done with a pretty clear image. These have just been kind of faded over. Well, time. yeah, this is, there are not been used. This is what they did after they took it. This is a daguerreotype. They'd put that brass mat on it, the glass, and then pop it into a, a case. And could you make a, a copy of this? Only a daguerreotype copy. There was no negative. And there are daguerreotype copies out there. They're usually fuzzy because you can't get it exact, the, the oh. distance exactly right. So each one is basically unique, and what was one of the point unique? Yes. If it was somebody like Abraham Lincoln, you'd probably do several and you sell them right. and stuff like that. This is the War Mexican War. That's a drummer. He's holding his drumsticks there, cadet. This is a sailor, not a not a United States sailor, just a sailor, and he has two gold earrings. That's how mm -hmm. you tell in the in the. 19th century, they put gold earrings so that they drowned and washed up on shore. You could pay for a Christian burial with the gold from their earrings. So a lot of sailors had gold gold rings in their ears. That's why you got an anthropology degree, right? Yeah, that's what. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's fascinating. I mean, over the years, I've been almost 50 years. It's just I, anything, any article or book or anything, I always try to read it. I just. I also heard that. Sailors sailed around the world. Yes. And he would get a gold earring. A neck. Oh no, I didn't hear that. I know you get a certificate, a neck tune. He'd get a. He'd wear a gold earring. Wasn't that and crossing the equator? Either that, or go around the world, cross the equator, uh, go around the world this way or that way. There are all kinds of things. World War II was big on that with yeah. the different certificates. I've got a lot of photographs of that. People going through the party that you got hazed and everything. This. this is a category, it's called pictures in pictures. Now her wow. father probably passed away and they used it as a substitute for another person. Not, not necessarily all the time for uh, you know, a family member passing away or, or a loved one. Sometimes it was just they weren't available, they were uh, you know, on the west coast in the gold rush or something. But it's a category of collecting and, and I do collect them. This is one of mine. That's probably 1846. Sorry, what is she it's, it's a photograph. It's a yeah. daguerreotype. It's, it's probably a picture of her dad or, or a loved one that's, okay. th that's not present when this was being taken. And generally it's because they passed away. Okay. Thank you. This is a woman, and that's a soldier she's holding. So it could be her son or her husband. So, some of them, they tell you what they are. You know, there'll be a slip of paper in the back or something. But a lot of them are just, you got to figure it out on your own. That's someone whose loved one died before photography. And so she's holding a silhouette of that person, probably her dad. There's another one. That's her boyfriend, maybe. Oh, you could be, you know, away at college or something. Now this guy had 
only had an image of, I believe that's his wife and the child. She probably died in childbirth. And that's just speculation. Though, but the, this, the thing that's neat about this is that this is, they are now using photography to, as a substitute for a human being. And that's probably two daughters. I own that one, too. And probably their father. Those frames are beautiful. Is what they made them. Yeah, the, uh, Scoville was one of the companies. I'm not sure. Come on in. It's very informal. I don't know if you can see very well from there. You can come over here. Okay, you can sit here. This is good. Okay. okay. <laughs> so that's one category. And the next category is hidden mothers, <gasps> where children wouldn't sit still. They had the photographers had tricks uh, so that the child would sit still, and usually it would sit on your mother's lap or whoever you're with, and they would calm them long enough to get a five second exposure. Ten seconds, five seconds. If they're moving around, it's going to be blurred. And that's what it looked like under the mat. So that's the same photograph. There she is, and then you take the mat off, and that's the mom there sitting there, and you can see the oval. A ring where the mat was. A lot of times you buy these like that, like this, and you don't realize there's more underneath it. And sometimes the things that are underneath it are more interesting than, than the <laughs> portrait, like this one here. There's another smiling oh. mother. That's the same photo without the mat. There's just a hand trying to hold the baby's head. That belongs to my sister. She's like. Baby hair. It's so cute. Now, if you have an oval, it'll take most of that hand out of there, but not all of it. There's another hidden mother. That's Cindy's also. She's got a great collection. Uh, okay, and that one is really neat. That w was an oval map like that, and uh, it was sealed. It had the original seal in it, so we knew nobody had ever opened it before. And it was this New York dealer that opened it. He, he posted it online and everything. And underneath that was this little girl mm -hmm. that the last person to see that was probably the daguerreotypist that took the picture because he's the one that sealed it all up. So a lot of times you see stuff, it's almost like a privilege that you're seeing something that's been covered for hundreds of years. <laughs> then there's, they used to save money by buying bolts of uh, material and the children would have clothing made that was identical. I don't, there's not too many people that do that today where you dress up identical to your sister or your brother. But in the 19th century, it was very prevalent. That's also Cindy's daguerreotype. She collects, there's two little girls with their dolls. Another two little girls. There's some guys. That's one from another category. Now this one is really neat. This is hairstyles and fashion. That's early probably mid-40s because of the low uh, neckline. It was real low earlier, and later on it got more closer around the neck. But that parody was unbelievable. I think it's very And that's only common to the 40s. I don't see it from the 50s and later ones. That's another elaborate parody, probably 1848 to 50. There's a favorite. Look at that. <laughs> but I've seen other ones with that braided thing like that around their ears. There's another fabric with the lace gloves. There. Kind of weird. I've never seen anything that like that in the past hundred years, really, of that style. I don't know how time consuming it would be. There's another woman. A little boy. Laughs. These are men's fashions. Now, this I collect, they're comb overs. Oh, I love balding it. Balding people would comb their hair from both sides of the head and tie it or somehow <laughs> attach it in the center head. I do I own that one. And then it gets really good. There's a guy who just tied it in a knot, combed it from both sides and tied it in a knot. This guy actually put a bow in the knot, incorporated the bow into the Hair. Uh, that's a, another one I own. That guy's in a smoking jacket, probably taking it home, not a studio. I'm assuming at that time the men 
probably won't have, so I think they have the Yeah, they have yeah. Yeah, Maybe yeah. just to get it out of the way, I don't know. That looks weird. I haven't seen that anywhere else except in the 1840s and maybe early 50s, where they actually took a picture of themselves. It wasn't like they were hiding it. See, that's a bow. All, all, all of these things you have showed us are taken with window light, right? Because there was no well, Yeah, they had skylights, they called it, and it would right. either be, uh, they'd have it built into the ceiling. Yeah. Like the more expensive galleries would do that, would have the, the building built for taking pictures. Mm -hmm. Some of the other ones would just be, well, and also an itinerant daguerreotype that's going around, and they would just take you outside. I've got a couple of those. Yeah. Where you just go outside in the backyard and they take a picture of the family. Yeah. This, I just recently got from the That's a half plate. That thing's going to grow on the top of his head. Yeah. And now the ethnic. These are, this is Thomas Easterly. He went around and took pictures of Native Americans. They're all museum owned by now. But that he categorized who they were, what tribes they were from, and everything. It's really been helpful for anthropologists. That's another one, that's famous Easter. He was out of St. Louis. Another one that, that also was an East one. There's probably a hundred of these. And he did he did it for the acclaim. He didn't do it for you know, he made money from portraits. People would pay for that, but they wouldn't pay for outdoor daguerreotypes unless it was their house or something. So certain categories are really hard to find. Native Americans are hard. Then these are Asian guys. Two of those. Okay. Uh, African American, that's a young couple. Came together. There's a family, probably grandpa and his grandchildren. And these they call caregivers. This is I mean, you can, there's affection in that picture. There's, that woman probably raised that kid. I'm not sure where it was taken or what the circumstances were, but hmm, there's one that was sort of reluctant to <laughs> put in there. The father, she would probably be a lot more comfortable to put it in here. There's another one that's smiling. The kids look very relaxed and responding. This is the first photograph of slavery ever taken. Those are uh, African Americans carrying cotton on their head, and that is a plantation from Georgia. The neat thing about this is it was found in Dallas, in an estate sale in Dallas about five years ago. I don't know what he paid for it, but he sold it at uh, West Cowan's Hinman's, I think for a quarter of a million dollars, because there are so many incredibly wealthy African Americans that collect that kind of memorabilia. But that was $250,000, and God knows what he paid for it. But it wasn't much, I'm sure. Now, classroom pictures are a, a, a category of collecting, too. And we have that one that's a really cool one. Well, that's Southworth and Hawes, and that's the style of classroom photographs. Later on, they did individuals and that kind of indoor classroom. There's one. Children, I don't know why they took it as a fat cat. So that's a class photo? Yeah, yeah, these are all class photos. Started almost right away when photography started. And there's the class photo that we have here. Probably about 1845. What did they do with the photos? Did they hang them in the school? No, well, I don't know. They may have made copies and gave them to the students that wanted them, or maybe they kept them. You know, in the, in the library or something, so you can see the different classes and stuff. I'm not sure, but they're in the same cases as the portraits and stuff when you find them, and you don't find these very often. And this is what I was talking about: itinerant photographers. You get your picture at your home. They get in like one of those wagons that you saw, yeah. and they go around to different towns and things like that, and they make an announcement that the there's a photographer in town or daguerreotypist. He came by the house, they all went outside, put chairs out there, and got their picture taken. There's another one. She's not wearing any, she's not all dressed up for a gallery picture or anything. That's just everyday clothes. They ran to the back and probably got a deal on it. Are they those clothes? Those are everyday clothes, yeah. This one is one of my favorites. The children with the doll. And those are not 
being particularly dressed up, and the mother at the top of the stairs looking over the Oh, top. I see the skirt. Yeah, <laughs> that's really cool. Oh, look at her. And there's some children. She got a little attitude. She didn't like, yeah. It would probably be straining to, to, to see this big contraction across from her. There's a little boy. Now, these are postmortems. A lot of times, you, people would pass away in the beginning, in the 40s, before they were able to get a photograph. And so they would, there was, it was a specialty, the garotypists would come out to your home and take pictures of deceased people. Uh, and they would put them in these cases, and a woman would put them in her purse and carry them so that the dead loved one was with them all the time. That's you know, one of the reasons to do that. There's a African American that did the postmortem. There's a sister with her brother. Dead. And beloved pet. A squirrel. It's something. Don't see the funny one. That's considered a postmortem. <laughs> it's a squirrel. <laughs> so this photograph is for sale here. And when I took it, I knew it was by Antoine Claudet, but I did some research on him just recently and found out he actually learned daguerreotyping from Daguerre. He was French, but he opened the first uh, photo gallery in England. And um, he was the photographer to the Queen, Queen Victoria, and also Napoleon III. He's a very famous, uh, desirable daguerreotypist, if you collect certain, certain daguerreotypist work. It's, it's one photograph from a, uh, a stereo view, and which we have, we can put, we'll revise it, we can put it together so they get a stereo view, or we can leave it the way it is with held in just a single case. Then, I don't know if you want to read along, I'm gonna, oops. Cases, that's another thing that people collect, and velvet pads, let's see it. These velvet pads are, are inside the case. So where do you find these? Uh, antique stores, collectors, eBay, uh, auctions, all over the place. Mm -hmm. See, these are the pads that go on the, yeah. when you close the daguerreotype or close that daguerreotype, there's a pad here. You can mm -hmm. see in there. And some of the daguerreotypists will put their here's the studio names. Oh, here we go. Sorry, Vic, to leave you there. Anybody else want to see that? I do. Uh, and people collect these. I collect them. Sometimes we look for famous photographers, like okay, Willard, who he was in New York. Richards, Philadelphia. Hey. This is Ezekiel Hawkins. It says Hawkins Apollo Rooms. He, that's the daguerreotype that I just showed you with the riverboat on it. Fontaine and Porter, they're the guys that took the panorama. And that's what their gallery stamp looks like. And I do have the daguerreotype that that came with. It's not a panorama, it's just a portrait. But so how were these made? The pads? Yeah. I, I have no idea, yeah, really. I don't know. That's more material. That's a good question, but I honestly don't know. I, know. I can tell you how to make a daguerreotype, but the pad, some of them are self. They're just material. I mentioned there's a press or something. Yeah, there's a press. There's a press. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it always velvet? Huh? Is it always about pressed velvet? No, so oh. all kinds of stuff. There's sometimes there's paper in there that, uh, and the back behind the uh, daguerreotype that'll have the gallery address and everything in it. How did they normally put their logo on it? Was it through the velvet? Yeah, sometimes they didn't too. You can get yeah. a really great daguerreotype and have no yeah. idea who took it. So they never didn't. They weren't into branding. So I that. guess. Yeah, <laughs> I wish they were because. Yeah, I'm make it easy for you. Now that's uh, Ezekiel Hawkins' outside case. The, the bottom part of the case was just leather, nothing, in, nothing embossed on it. That's a six plate case. That's a quarter plate. Really elaborate. Some of them are very elaborate. The ones that aren't elaborate are the early ones. 
that's what I collect. So I'm always looking for just plain old leather cases that you would find silhouettes in from the 30s and 20s, and then they hadn't made standard cases yet, and so they put them in silhouette cases. And that's probably the 1850s. So there's books on them, on cases and everything, and that's, that's it. Is there a collector's society? Or? Yes, the Darien Society. It's online. You can look at, look at that. And you can also go online and put in 1848 Panorama Cincinnati. And it'll bring up what the picture that I showed you. But you it, somehow they made it so you can zoom in yourself with your fingers you know, go, and go right down to the people. It's even more detailed than this was. It's, it's amazing. So you can, you'll see things that you don't see with your naked eye. And it, you know, it's a two mile stretch of, of shoreline that if they blew it up as much as they could, it would be 170 feet long and 20 feet high. I mean, that is, a, without losing clarity. After a while, anything loses it. If the daguerreotypists took the picture in focus and everything, and that sometimes they did, but Porter and Fontaine were incredible photographers and were spot on for, for light, the focus, everything. So, if anybody has any questions? I do. So, when you um, acquire one and then sell it later, is that in order to buy a new one? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, I, so like it's my better like ones, I can't keep off them very long. It's that? getting a little buzz off of a new thing, right? Yeah. In a well, good it's way. nice to own it. You can do some research on it, study it. Keep oh, it I never thought that. Okay. And then something else comes Get along that you want, and you're forced to sell. So oh, it's fun. At the end of the day, it's just fun and research. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I, well, a lot of them I've owned in, in this, I've owned before, but no longer own because I can't afford to keep a $60,000. <laughs> I got it. That's can cool. You, can you go into the process and how you enlarge it to get to a full This gentleman here, Don Netzer, is the person that did the enlarging. Or, well, I, I was with him, but he, he's the one that did the technical enlarging. If you want to, can you tell him how you did that? It was done with a scanner. Well, it was done with a scanner, and what was interesting in talking to you about uh, there being no pixels or anything like that yeah. is change the way I think they ought to be reproduced next time. Sure. Because okay. my particular printer will print 2,880 dots per inch, but if you take it to a photo lab, they only want to print 300 dpi because uh, that's what they're set up for. So we'd have to get around that hurdle. Right. If, do, do you want to know how to do a daguerreotype? That I know how to do. No, yeah, <laughs> no I, was just, I, I was just wondering how they got to this point, because you were starting with this. And it was you, either you with his scan. Uh, that one over there was done from a photograph that was done in layers. So it was just experimenting with different techniques and then Don's were so good that yeah, they were stuck with Well, you scanned the original up to the print size. Okay. And I don't think they lost anything from that picture. Yes, ma'am. Gently. Gently. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting because if you look at some of these uh, daguerreotypes, you can't really tell what it is. So once you scan it and it comes up on your computer, you're amazed at what you see. Here is a good example of one of them that's for sale here. And like you, like you said, there's, a, there's no pixels. Right. There's no pixels, but when you scan it, I guess you're introducing pixels into it. Then, well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's why, that's why I, I have rethought the process of how these need to be reproduced, if you want to reproduce them. This daguerreotype is that one there, and you can see there's lace, which you can't see from it. There, you can see the detail is incredible. Look at that. That's off of that daguerreotype, that still tiny daguerreotype. So all that information is in that daguerreotype. 